well, it seems right and appropriate that if we're going to talk about the potter and the clay, that we should actually bring in some pottery. Does that not make sense? So I brought in a couple of pieces that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, first of all, I brought in a first century oil lamp, and there's going to be a picture on screen of the oil lamp because it is quite small. So you, you see this little picture of this oil lamp, and you see it here. This dates back, this little oil lamp, I, this is mine, uh, to 100 AD, first century oil lamp. You'll notice it's a little bit hard to see on the picture. I should, I should have just taken a better picture. Um, if you came up and looked at this, you'll actually see there's some design. So after worship, if you want to look, come up and look at them, they're here. But you'll see, you'll see a little design on them. You go, oh, look, the potter, when he made the oil lamp, took time and artistic value at creating an oil lamp in the first century. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, we got this one in England uh, years ago. But, uh, but if you go to the Mediterranean world, wherever the Roman Empire was, there are hundreds of thousands of these little oil lamps. This was what they lit a house up with. And so there were a lot of them. And they, some of them are very plain, uh, and some of them are quite ornate. Uh, and the fact is, this was the main lighting mechanism for a home. So every home would have more than one of these, just like our homes have more than one light. Um, this was theirs. The second one is a picture on screen. I didn't want to bring this pot in because it's a bit more fragile. Uh, the, this one is mine as well. Uh, this dates back to 3100 BC. I bought this in Bethlehem uh, at a Syriac Orthodox shop, uh, uh, which is a, another conversation in itself. But, uh, but that pot dates to 3100 BC. Just to give you some frame of reference, uh, do you all remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Raise your hands. Oh, good. Some of us do. Good, good. Uh, Abraham dates, just so you have some frame of reference, Abraham dates to 2000 B.C. This precedes Abraham, uh, which is pretty cool. It also says, because uh, I, I could buy the pot, it says how many pots they have dating back to that period of time. They have a lot of stuff. This one, I, as I said, came from Israel. Uh, and so they have, I'm just telling you, because I can have these items, it, it just says that there is a huge amount of inventory that they can sell because they, they just have so much stuff. The, the last chunk, I have a picture. I brought a chunk. This is made out of clay as well. Let's th see the third picture. This is Dan. That's me this January picking up a terracotta sewer pipe. We should all have a chunk. Roman, this, this dates to 800 A.D., and, uh, and it was at a, a, a site called Bethshain, uh, which is in Galilee. Uh, Jesus would not have gone there, by the way. That was a Gentile Roman city. Jesus would never have gone into that kind of city. But for you who know New Testament, this was a city of the Decapolis. Uh, and, uh, and they had, they're doing some digs there, but you could see where the terracotta pipe was. The city was destroyed about 1000 AD by an earthquake, and they're uncovering pieces of the city, um, and uh, I, I took a chunk of sewer pipe. Isn't that cool? <laughs> there I am, yeah. Uh, so, so the point of all of this being, when you start talking about the potter and the clay, you talk about those three pictures I just, the pictures there and then these pieces here. When you start talking about these things, it says that that pottery was one of the main industries at producing items that help people function in life. You see how that works? So for us it would be other things, but in that culture, in that day, and you'll notice from 3100 BC to 1000 AD, you have pottery being one of the primary modes of which they created items for living. So you have light, that little pot you saw the picture of probably held grain to make bread and flour, and now you have a sewer pipe that took care of other human functions. Uh, and the Romans were very clean, but they had to have something that would be able to be productive for their culture, and it tended to be clay. 
So it's no surprise then when you read scripture in the readings that Matt just did a few minutes ago, you'll notice that, that the potter and the clay is a common metaphor that's used in scripture because it's common to the life of people. When you read the writers, when they're instructing people about who God is and what God wants to teach us, as in our Old Testament reading with Jeremiah, the fact of the matter is they're using very human things that people were very, very familiar with. He did not choose things they were not familiar with. For us today, we have other ways of living, so these things aren't going to be quite the same as, of importance as it was in that particular day. So what we find then, <clears throat> that we start out with this, and the understanding that we have, is that every piece of pottery that you have, if it's a sewer pipe, to a, a oil lamp, to a, a little pot that holds grain, what, what I like is this understanding there was a potter who was very capable and careful, and in some cases, as is this oil lamp, uh, was very artistic in how they designed it. This wasn't just done arbitrarily and just mass-produced and slapped out. Somebody's hands touched this and made it into the item that it is today. That's why when, I, uh, when we read the Old Testament lesson, when we look at Jeremiah chapter 18, you have an interesting story that takes place. Jeremiah is the great prophet. I'm going to tell you, the, the gift of being a prophet is not a good thing. You hear me say that again. The gift of being a prophet is not a good thing. So if someone says to you, I have the gift of prophecy, just so you put this in perspective, every prophet was killed by the Jews. So if you say, I have the gift of prophecy, death is coming your way. This is not a good thing. So Jeremiah has this biting, compelling call that God placed on him to speak to the people of Judah because they were drifting far away from God and God put a burn that compelled Jeremiah to speak despite knowing all the persecution that Jeremiah was going to have to deal with. He became a voice for God to the people of Judah to call them back to repentance and back to a reconciliation with God. So what does he do? Well, we see in Jeremiah 18, when it starts out in its reading, it says that Jeremiah, God spoke to Jeremiah and said, I want you to go to the potter's house. Uh oh, you just discovered there's a potter's guild in ancient Israel. We have one here in Ann Arbor. The Ann Arbor Potter's Guild. They sell amazing stuff. But here what we have is the Jewish Potter's Guild. And Jeremiah is told to go down and to see the Potter's Guild, see the potter working at the potter's house. And it says this, he goes to the Potter's Guild, and you read the story in Jeremiah 18. And as he goes there, he steps into the room. He doesn't have a particular message. God didn't say, go to the Potter's Guild and say the following. He said, just go to the potter's house. Go to the house. He went into the house and he's watching the potter working. And he saw the potter shaping and moving and manipulating the clay. The clay. And then he noticed something. It says in the text that the, the, the clay, what, the word that was used is marred. The NIV says it's marred. That means the clay was flawed. There was something wrong with the clay. Not with the potter, but with the clay. And so the potter had to take the clay to work out the flaw that was in the clay. And any of you who have worked with clay know that. There can be holes and crevices and little uh, in, uh, things that are just not healthy to make a, an item, to, cr to craft something. And so, so they had to take the damaged piece and he had to start over. So he watched the potter take this pot that was starting to be shaped and, and the potter said something in Hebrew and then reshaped it. Started all over. He said, this is, this is terrible. And then the message from Jeremiah came. And this is what he said to Israel. Likely in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O Israel. Let me say it again. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand. You are in my hand. So now we have the picture of this. That God is the potter... And he is shaping the clay. And who becomes the clay? We do. We become the clay. God is speaking through clearly through Jeremiah. And he's saying to the people of Israel in that day and at that time, he's saying, listen, I, God, the potter, God is the guy. I'm the guy. God as the potter is saying, I'm watching over you. I am looking out for you. God as the potter is saying, I'm the potter shaping and forming you. You are in my hand. You are in my hand, which means that God is in control. 
God's the one in control, not you, not me. God himself is in control. God crafts the world we live in. God is active in our world. We know that God is omniscient, meaning God is all-knowing attributes of God. So he knows all things. We know that God is omnipresent, meaning that God is in all places at the very same time, which is beyond my human comprehension. So here's the God who's omniscient, the God who's omnipresent, the God who speaks into this world and says, I am the potter and you're my clay, and I get to shape you and form you, and I have the privilege of taking this clay and manipulating it into wonderful, wonderful things. But, but you know, you and I, as much as I say, God's the one in control. You and I already know that that's difficult to comprehend and even to accept. It's easy to say that, yes, God's in control, but it's very, very difficult to embrace that, to embrace it and say that God is in control. You see, if God is the potter and we're the clay, it does mean this. It means that God is active in our world, and he's directing, and he's caring for you and me. And that can create lots of questions. Because there are things that happen in our world that aren't so good. And we wonder, where is God in this world? We can also say, if God's the active in the world and he's creating and I'm the potter, he, I'm, the, I'm the clay and he's the potter, that means he's active in shaping me, but I don't know if I want that. Because in essence, what each of us wants to do, and each of us is like this, is that we want to be in control. You and I want to be in control of our lives. And when things don't go the way we want them to go, we get really annoyed because we have a plan and we want the plan to be followed because it's our plan. Now, Billy Graham, and, and to you who are older, this is really striking. I'm going to share a Billy Graham quote. Some of you will know who Billy Graham is. Uh, maybe a big chunk of us here, but Billy Graham was the outspoken American evangelist from the 1950s to about 2000. He had profound influence in our culture. And in some way, his legacy has influence in our culture. But now he's into his mid-90s, and his influence has certainly waned. But he has left a lasting ministry that happens in America, still in evangelical America. Uh, but it's funny, folks, I have to explain now to my younger students who Billy Graham is. Because he's not active as he once was. Uh, I remember years ago going to a Billy Graham crusade. Remember doing that. Profound movement in our culture. In the late 1980s, when Billy was in his 70s, uh, he was interviewed uh, at, a, at an Ottawa crusade, and he also did a TED Talk, did an active TED Talk on technology. And I, I'm going to share, I'm going to put two quotes together, and I'm going to share this quote. Listen, listen to what he has to say. We live on a diet of up-to-the-minute news and 15-minute celebrities. Folks, this is in 1998. Isn't that something? While we ache for a transcendent, timeless touch. So, you see what he's saying? Listen, he says, we're living on a diet of everything comes really fast. But what we ache for is something that's transcendent, something that goes beyond us. In fact, he says, we're looking for something that has a timeless touch. Not so immediate, but a timeless touch. The information age, Graham goes on, says, may go down in history as the period when our culture forgot the most important thing, that our souls need to breathe and grow, that we're separated from God, that we're, notice the phrase, we're dead people walking. And then he says this at the end, you who are the clay and looking at God as the potter. Technology projects the myth of control over our mortality, of control over our mortality. We want to believe that we have control over our lives to do what we want to do. And, and what Graham is saying very clearly is the potter is in control, we're the clay, and we try to make, it, make believe and say that we're the potter and we're manipulating our own lives with our own clay. So we're both the potter and we're the clay. We can't do it. And what happens, I love, I love this little phrase, but what happens with all this is we begin to have something called a, a spiritual tantrum. We don't get our way, and we have, a, we have a little spiritual tantrum. 
Now, you could do a little tantrum when you have a two-year-old and, and they have tantrums, which I can't imagine ever happens in the Hine house. You have four perfect children. Uh, yeah, it, it, he goes, you have no idea. Uh, you, you know what the tantrum is. The little two-year-old falls down on the floor kicking their feet. Anybody ever seen a tantrum? Uh, yeah, yeah, a whole bunch of us. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah some of the children are, oh yeah, that's me. Uh, uh, we have a tantrum and we start kicking our feet and wailing our arms. And when my kids were two years old, it was pretty easy to take care of. You pick them up and carry them away. It was a lot harder when they were in eighth grade. Do eighth graders have tantrums? Yeah, they certainly do. How about this one? How about 35 year olds? Do they have tantrums? Yes, yeah, Alonda's going, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do, do 50 year olds have tantrums? Yes. Do 80 year olds have tantrums? Yes. Because when we don't get our own way, we then have a tantrum and we begin to bellyache that this is not the way it's supposed to be. And all of that is saying, it's all make-believe, because what we're trying to say is, we're in control, we are both the potter and we're the clay. And Jeremiah says to Israel, listen, listen to me, listen, God's in control, God's in control, God's in control. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans says it this way, he, he ran into a church in, in Rome that was having lots of questions about, about the potter and the clay, but who's actually in control? And this is what Paul writes in Romans, but who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pot pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? Does not God, the potter, have the right to do the calling? And we don't like to hear that because we want to be in control. Of course, you know, in all of this, the minute we say we're in control, what ultimately happens is we get in trouble. We make misjudgments. We create obstacles of God reaching into our lives and us reaching out to the people around us. In fact, what I do know is this, is God is the potter. God is the potter working with his clay, is gracious and good and loving. He is. He's gracious and good and loving. And what he does is he takes you and me, who may feel like we're the beast, and turn us into the beauty. Take we who are the beast and turn us into the beauty. And we forget that. And the more we try to wrestle with control, the more we stay like the beast. And what God wants to do is create you into an extraordinary beauty because you're his child and he loves you he loves you so much jesus is walking into the city of nain and as he walks into nain he sees coming out of the city gate a widow and he looks at the the widow and he knows it's a terrible thing and you could tell she was a widow because there was no other family walking with her. So it says that a large crowd was with her. There was deep grieving because in that world to be a widow and her only son had died meant that she was bound to destitution and a very, very hard life. And Jesus and his disciples are walking up to her and they're beginning to see what's going on. They can read it right away. They see the man being carried in the air on shoulders by other men being carried out to be buried. That meant, see, in, in first century, you were always buried within 24 hours. So that meant that this man had been alive within 24 hours and now was being buried. It was horribly sad. And Jesus sees this happening and his heart is broken because you see the potter's hand is on you and me. And what breaks the heart of God breaks our heart, but what breaks our heart breaks the heart of God. And you see, this bowl was made for Gail and me by a good friend of ours, Cecilia Knox. She made this bowl. I look at this bowl, and I love the blue colors. I love how she did the white inside. I love the shaping of it. I look at Cecilia's hands, Cecilia's hands on this. 
So when I touched the, the bowl and I look at it, and she gave us a set, two bowls. And when I look at this bowl, I think, oh, the craftsman's hand was on this bowl. Jesus sees what he crafted there, and that young man dying. And you know what the potter did? He went up to that grave, getting, going to the graveyard, that funeral procession. And he stops the funeral procession, and he says, I, I love how he does this, don't cry. Oh, really? Don't cry. Don't cry. And then the potter speaks to the man, young man, rise up. Young man, rise up. And the man came back to life. And the man sitting there in the air being carried by his buddies, there in that moment, there is a, a, a sound of st stunned astonishment for the potter who is the one who's omniscient and the potter who is the omnipresent, who is the potter who chose to come into this world and live in this finite body, this humanity, this potter who loves us beyond anything we could ever imagine. This potter reached out and said, what was dead comes to life. Dead comes to life. The potter's hand touched that child. Just like the potter raised his hands and the storm was stilled and the potter reached out and touched eyes and the blind could see and the top potter reached out to the lame and the lame could walk and the potter reached out to those that were emotionally broken and grieving and that grief and that hurt and that pain was taken away for the potter's hand changes everything. For the potter's hand is good and gracious and love. Now we don't see what happens when that little, that young man rises up. It says that everyone, I love that verse, it says everyone was in awe. I think the writer wrote an understatement. I think there was stunned silence and then that eruption of absolute praising. Can you imagine the mother? The mother, the boy is brought down, this young man put down to the ground and he jumps up and a mother's arms wrapped around her son. And the potter standing there watching this and loving that woman, that son, those people and loving you and me. And then there was the last night. This, by the way, here, this is a pottery set that St. Luke owns. It's a beautiful set. Look at the beauty. It's signed. It's a beautiful set. There, the potter on the night he was betrayed lifts his hands and says, this is my body. And he gives them bread that we'll receive in a few minutes. And then after the supper was complete, he picks up the chalice and says, this is my blood, receive this. And know that this has all been given to you to strengthen and encourage you. For you're my children. So if you came into worship today, folks, and you're just tired, you're just really, really fatigued, I want you to know that the potter's hand is on you. You need to hear that today. The potter's hand is on you. If you came in today and you're just broken emotionally, you're dealing with stuff in your life that you just don't know how you're going to get out of it, I'm just telling you, the potter's hand is on you. You're not alone. God is walking with you. If you're today just suffering physical hurt and pain and you know people around you that are suffering hurt and pain, just know that the potter's hand is with you. You're not alone. For the potter takes you and me and he shapes the clay and he says you're my children and frankly if you look at each other turn and look at each other yeah Matthew I know you're in the front row look at me uh, look at each other you're pretty good chunks of clay you really are you're wonderful chunks of clay because God created and shaped you, and he knows your name. In Jesus' name, the hand 
upon us. Amen.